Okay. <clears throat> hey there again, everybody. Let's take some <clears throat> a couple minutes to answer some questions. I've got Heavenly Habitats on Mural Joe Live. It's I guesstimate this being approximately three feet wide. How would you suggest maintaining an even gradient across, say, a 30-foot span? Great question. And that seems to be a hot issue. You know, people that are doing big murals. It is a real challenge to get a smooth blend of color if you're doing a gradient. The way I do it is this way. I mix two colors that are going to be just the beginning of the gradient. You know, I have my first color of a gradient and the last color. I'll just mix two colors for just the top. And I'll put those parallel horizontally, you know, like this. And I'll roll them on with two different rollers, two different buckets, then I'll blend them with a brush. Then when I'm done doing that across the whole wall, and they'll dry too, you know, you'll kind of work in columns and they'll dry before you get to the next one. But because you've got the colors already mixed in buckets, it matches. And you're only doing a space that's not very wide. So they match up. When you're done, you get rid of that first color that's on top, you remix it to be the third color. Then you come back now you got to make sure that you've mixed enough of that second color that you don't run out. So mix twice as much of that one. Mix your third color, do the same thing. So you're going to redo that second one right over the top. It's going to match because it's the exact same color. Then you do another row of parallel colors. Blend it with the brush as you go. So you see, you're working both in columns and vertical sections and moving your way from left to right across the wall working horizontally so that you're blending two colors then you revolve it it's kind of like leapfrog you know and then you blend those and then you revolve it the key is having those colors pre-mixed and having enough that you don't have to rematch it later I, uh, I'll demonstrate that one of these days maybe we can do it on a live paint day another question I've been told to use black and white sparingly or it will flatten your painting how is that it works so well for you? Well, I do use a lot of black and white, but I never used to. I I used to, I, well, I, I was kind of of that same mindset. You know, I was afraid that black would be too much of an unnatural and dark color. The real issue is just the misuse of it. You don't want to, if, if you take black and you try to lighten it with white, then it's going to, it's going to get grayer. The key is always start with your primary colors, your mixing colors that don't that have as little black and white as possible in them and then adjust that color to the lightness or darkness that you need it. Don't start with the brightness or with the lightness or the darkness that you need. Start with just the color itself. Learn how to identify colors, you know. If I was mixing a color like this table, you can see that this, then what I would do is I would mix a pure orange. And this table doesn't look that orange. Well, yeah, because after I did the orange, then I would add black and white to gray it out and to really mute this color so that it was no longer the intense orange. So you make, I need to identify first what the color is and then the intensity. If you use black and white in that way, it won't ruin your paintings. The problem is, is when you take a color that already has black and then you lighten it with white, or you take a color that already has white and you darken it with black, then yeah, it's, it's going to totally gray out the painting. I think that you could get a lot of depth even if you were using only black and white, if um, you use the contrast in the right way. I don't know if I agree with the philosophy that black and white flattens your painting. Let's see... Um, there was another question here um, in some of your time-lapse demonstrations. You seem to be completing an area left to right as one may read a book. How are you able to get an entire mural laid out so perfectly without chalking out or blotting out the complete mural first? Um, I don't know how to answer that. Let's go to the next one. I have seen you paint some things like a tree by beginning with a dark background and working up to the highlights. This is an awesome technique. Are there specific times you will work this way, like, for example, only when you are painting an object in the foreground? Well, I'm, I'll attach a video on, onto this. You can see uh, what I've been working on, what I was doing yesterday. 
another Coke bottle, a bottle of Dr. Pepper. Kind of like if you were working with layers in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. I, I lay down my first layer that's what I would identify as the basic color uninfluenced by all the light sources and then I start adding layers of where the light is influencing that object. I find that an easier way to think of it. A painting for me is kind of like building, kind of like I'm building a, a world. So I'm imagining the, you know, I try to get the foundational concept first and then add all the fancy lighting after that. I see that you use black and white a lot. Oh, we already answered that one. Uh, let's see. Um, Let's see if we, we can answer this one right to left. How are you able to get an entire mural laid out so perfectly? I mean, I don't get murals laid out perfectly. They don't. They're not perfect. They, they always have problems. But um, uh, what, I, what I always try to do when I'm, when I'm doing that right to left is, I guess, I do things according to the other things that are already in the picture. Like I always say, it's easier for me to adjust what I already see than it is to plan the whole thing from the start. So I always have a general concept. I give myself a lot of freedom to paint things in the wrong places. I repaint a lot of stuff. You know, I'll paint a person and then I won't like the, where the arm was going and so I'll repaint it going a different direction. It's a lot of trial and error for me. So don't think that I have this perfect plan from the start every time. I, I just find that when you follow certain rules you're able to make pretty much anything look like it fits, make it look natural and you'll be able to identify you know little flaws in your in, in your system as you go along. Uh, let's go to another one here. I've got them starred on my email. Mr. Robson, maybe it's funny but I have a problem with painting foreground grass. Can you explain the process? Well, grass definitely is challenging. Um, that's another thing that would be good to have a demonstration. And I'm going to see if I can do that on, on another one of these live paint days. But the key to it is as it gets further away, your angle changes and you don't see the shadows underneath the grass blades. To get it to look natural, you want your, the upper portion that's close to the horizon to be lighter. And you want the lower portion to uh, be darker and the reason for that is because you can see the shadows where you're looking down towards your feet so foreground grass make it darker than the horizon and make it gradually get lighter and lighter a way to do that is to lay down a base layer that's a very gray shade of green then use a texture brush uh, so a, a brush that you can just kind of do vertical Somebody's calling me. Let's see this. Is. Oh, calendar reminder. Um, right, Robson grass. Yeah, you got a um, ver oh, vertical, I always get vertical and horizontal mixed up. Vertical. So you've got a brush and you're doing your grass texture on it. And as you go, uh, as you're doing, doing that, you're... Man, I totally lost my train of thought. What in the heck was I talking about? Okay, you, you lay down a layer of kind of a gray shade of green, and what that is 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 all the shadows. Just like when I do trees, it's the same concept. So then you get your brighter green, bright green, right? That's way too bright. Get a brighter green that's probably still darker than the color of your sky in your picture. That's just a general rule. Grass almost always appears darker than the sky. That is if it's not a cloudy, overcast sky. And then you do the bright over, neat, over the top of that gray shade of green. And, and having gray underneath an intense color always gives you a lot of depth. Try it that way. And then as you get higher and higher towards the horizon, more and more of, of the bright color so that you're not leaving nearly as much gray showing. Hey Joe, I've got to say, you are an inspiration. I can really appreciate the way you explain your techniques and apply them as you do. I've been airbrushing for 10 years, 8 of those for a playground theming company. Now stepping out on my own. The challenge is finding work. Any suggestions? 
Mike Moser sent this email, and um, he also sent his website. Um, constructive criticism is appreciated. I did check it out, Mike. I, I looked at it. Very good work. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to criticize the work. It's very good. Uh, you obviously have the ability to learn on your own. Best answer I can give for finding work. I do understand that. You know, I became self-employed eight, nine years ago, something like that, and I have gotten probably 95% of my jobs from word of mouth referrals. Word of mouth referrals that started with my group of friends, the community that you're closest to. So it's my philosophy that by starting small, you start right. Because, you know, if you make mistakes, they're just little. And, you know, you gradually build that. But if you try to be clever and build a, and build a big brand and reputation before you have all of the, you know, the practice of handling it. I've had a lot of contractor friends that have been overwhelmed really fast and were discouraged and quit the business because of that exact thing. So my best advice is know as many people as you can know and get, get the word out by talking and talk to your friends and don't have any shame and doing work for friends and just getting everyone to know you as that guy that does that. You need like the idea of your work and you to be synonymous. When they think of you, they think of your work because then it comes up in conversation and that conversation is what gets you the work and it's a ladder and, it, and you, you end up getting bigger and bigger jobs, higher and higher profile things. But the people in the higher positions they typically want somebody that's worked their way up already. And I don't know where anybody, you know, when people email me and ask me questions, for all I know, you're already making more money than I am. I'm just sharing with you the pattern that I've noticed along my journey.